So, I, I'm about 29 years old, so I've been playing games since I was about three. Um, so a long time now. And back when I, I can remember uh, being young, you'd pay for like Super Mario or Zelda, especially Ocarina of Time and other such games. Um, and what you'd pay for is everything. You didn't get DLC, there was no such thing as that. There wasn't any costume packs unless it was from completing the game. Um, normally you would just pay £40 and you would get everything with the game. Some games like Street Fighter did tend to do like extra versions later on, um, but normally it was a case of you bought that game, you got everything that game offered you. There is an aspect of volatility when it comes to the games industry. Not set in established ways such as other media giants like film and music, it is constantly transforming its ways of selling the product. Now more than ever is this evident. More people than ever are playing games and the industry is valued in the hundreds of billions. Technology is evolving faster than the business practices behind it, with games development costs increasing, publishers are faced with the unending task of figuring out new ways to monetize games, as the retail price tag alone is no longer profitable. To get a closer look at how the proverbial cogs of the games industry machine are turning, I've taken it upon myself to interview games developers and industry professionals. That's, that's not a big deal. The lights threw you off. They should maybe be a little bit smaller. Like they should fit in on one of those panels. Yeah. Well, um, when it started, it was just buy the game and that's it, and you got the game. Uh, and then it's progressing to DLC, extra content, and a lot of the time you get a game that's released and it's not even the full game, and you need to go and buy another thing to get the, the what should be the full game. Uh, and then there's been like a lot of public backlash of that and then with the implementation of loot boxes more and more so uh, and you're just ever since Battlefront 2 and this massive uprising of hatred against these loot boxes uh, uh, I think the industry is starting to finally, well at least the AAA studios are starting to be like okay okay right we'll, we'll stop, we'll take a back seat but you never know, EA really likes money The reason for the backlash the AAA industry has faced recently is not without precedent. We don't need to look further than the mobile apps market to where the monetization practices in major games can be traced back. So called freemium games like Clash of Clans and Game of War cost nothing up front, yet generate massive returns through player interaction over time. So yeah, like the likes of Candy Crush or, or Clash of Clans that are just like little addictive games um, and you get major studios being like, okay, if we can just capitalize on that same market in our massive game, then we can make a load of money. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a bad thing because then you're paying for something and then having to pay for it again and again and again. And it's two models that, sh that shouldn't be smooshed together. They're, I think they should be treated separately. You can definitely have a free game with an app purchases, that's fine. Uh, but if you've got a full game, you shouldn't have more purchases on top of that, that that are required to play the game properly. So Oil um, for our um, App Store release is a, is a paid game, um, it's $1.99, it's $1.99. Um, I mean that has certain sort of um, feelings about it already, it's a paid game, it's a premium game. Um, it does have a premium look and feel and sort of philosophy to it, um, but we're never going to get the amount of revenue that uh, free games create. Um, but that wasn't um, the goal, our goal was to target the kind of people who are into design, uh, into sort of smaller games like that, like indie games. Um, and who are willing to spend what is basically a, a normal price for a bag of crisps these days on a game. Um, free to play would have probably served us better um, because the free to play market we can have um, 150,000 downloads uh, in, a, in a day um, versus 20,000 in a day. Uh, that's the kind of differences we really saw. Now the major publishers are pursuing the games as a service model. They want their games to generate revenue over long stretches of time, prioritising revenue from player retention over revenue from copies sold. I'd say 
it does owe a lot of it to the mobile market. The mobile market definitely showed that loot boxes um, showed that microtransactions, you know, paying for gems or in-game currency was definitely a viable option. The main difference though is most mobile games were free and this was a means for people to support the company and the company to get some sort of revenue. Uh, this sort of practice being put into a game that's £60, sometimes even 80 and 90 if you get like digital deluxe editions. Um, I don't really think it's fair on consumers um, and I think it can be quite bad practice. I wouldn't but at the same time I do understand that prices have changed for development costs and who knows how much they really are now as they're not very open with that stuff. Although this isn't a new concept with games such as World of Warcraft always having required a paid subscription, new games like Destiny and Star Wars Battlefront 2 are prime examples of the industry's current heading. Yeah, I think we're coming to a point where making not just games but consoles and other hardware before uh, other hardware in general has just become a incredibly expensive, um, kind of, yeah, incredibly expensive, uh, and we're looking at kind of games that are as a service that kind of have a longer lifespan, um, that kind of um, have you know live ops or just general like updating updating by the development team um, which in turn kind of uh, grows your fan base and you get like a steady 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 stream of income through uh, kind of microtransactions or just uh, general kind of in-game purchases so it's a lot more cheaper uh, to do rather than having to spend a year or a year or two or even you know up of two years developing game well, I think it's a bit like how you say there, where Evolve was a massive deal when it first came out. Um, Evolve was a strange, where strange case where not much of the game had been shown, but they were pushing pre-order bonuses and pushing all these extra things you could get, like extra skins, guns, monsters. Um, and at the time, that was a massive deal, as we hadn't even seen the game yet, um, and they were still pushing all this money and this things we could purchase. So, <laughs> all right. So what I'm seeing is. There's a total, one, two, three, four, 12 different packs. 12 different packs of day one downloadable content for Evolve. 12. And these aren't cheap. I think it did desensitize us to it, and I think it did sort of pave the way for that to be normal. You also had like Mass Effect 3 and Mass Effect 2, Street Fighter, the Capcom, where they're putting on disc DLC. Um, and that sort of thing also helped the whole birth of this, uh, you pay for skins, you pay for all the extra content. While it might be on the disc, um, we now accept it that that's something, pre-order culture is another thing, where people are now trying to push, uh, you know, pre-order the game before you even see anything about it to get this really rare skin, character, whatever it is, extra missions now. Assassin's Creed Origins had missions for specific stores. Uh, GameStop had a mission you could only get if you bought the game out of GameStop, which is that's crazy to me, like, back, like, imagine making content and then saying, oh well, you didn't buy it from the right store, so you're not getting that content, even though it's on the disc. Yeah, business models have changed dramatically and they seem to be more trying to sort of get money other means other than just the game, because game prices, while have been a bit stagnant and sort of staying where they are, uh, they're definitely not the same as they were back then, there's too much content that's hidden away behind paywalls. On the other side of the spectrum, we have indie games. Smaller budget games. Games that aren't as risk averse when it concerns creative freedom. How are these indie games evolving alongside their more expensive counterparts? Uh, this is something that we're kind of doing. So, because we're making a VR game, uh, one thing that the industry, uh, at least AAA studios, are scared of is releasing games with a very dynamic uh, movement system because they're scared of motion sickness, they're scared of uh, pushing the kind of how crazy you can go with VR. And the studios they don't care. They're like, okay, no, we're gonna make an astronaut that twirls and spins in space. And, and AAA studios are like, nah, we're not touching that. There's a lot of backlash from that. 
Um, so we're we're making the swing mechanic, and um, a lot of the time, like we've went to or we've heard from industry professionals that, that are people that hand out funding, because a lot of these big VR companies handed out funding to industry studios. But when we told them that we were making a a game where you swing and move so dynamically, they're like, yeah, no, we're, we're not going to fund you. We don't want to back that. So I think you can, at least from our experience, uh, they're not as they don't take as many risks, so you don't get as like as much interest and in stuff coming out of AAA games anymore. However, the word indie is itself evolving. In music, indie used to be music your friends had recorded up in their garage. Now indie has become its own genre. And as AAA publishers are starting to acquire indie studios to publish their games under their wing, it begs the question whether the term needs redefining, as the lines between indie and AAA start to blur. We're going to see a lot more investment in indie companies because I think there's a lot more money in indie companies. Um, yeah, I think like maybe two years, two years ago, maybe even five years ago, um, I think independent games were kind of seen as something that didn't really make money. But now we're seeing just the ease uh, in which you can kind of make something, and the ease in which you can kind of sell something, and the ease in which you can kind of make money from something. Um, so I think we are going to see uh, a lot more kind of devolver digital type uh, publishers who kind of, you know, as you say, be that kind of umbrella, um, kind of like that umbrella for many indie companies to just, you know, support them and you know, kind of profit from them as well. I think in a way, yeah, I think there's, there's it's definitely uh, like compared to a few years ago where a lot of indie games are kind of like smaller games and which we kind of like you needed to kind of rely on things like Steam Greenlight. Uh, I think there's a there's a lot more opportunity now for the indie, indie games and indie game companies to go big publishers to get their game out there for a wider audience. So yeah, I think there's definitely a, a smaller divide between indie games and AAA games and kind of companies now. So as indie and AAA games start to share their space in the marketplace, it seems like the industry is in a good spot. But as Brexit looms over the UK, what does this mean for the UK's games development? Could any good come from it? Well, in ways, yes, and then in other ways, no. Like, it would be a lot harder to get, to employ someone who is outside of Britain. Um, but if there's tax breaks and, and fun, more funding available, then... Yeah, so yes and no. In some areas, yes, in some areas, no. It will be a, a toss-up. Brexit is a complicated um, subject. It's probably not something I know 100% on, but in regards to how employment will work for it and how we will be looking for new talent and how talent will come to Britain, um, it's very, very difficult to tell. Um, what you'll find, I think, is that we'll have to look more in home and land, um, more British people going into it, hopefully, um, but the worst case is we're going to miss out on a massive talent pool that Europe offers us um, and it might prove difficult to get the required skills needed. So yeah, if, if, Brexit, if Brexit finally you know, appears out of whatever closet it's hiding in, like I imagine the, the games companies that are here in the UK will become stronger. I mean, politically it's a, a hard issue for some of the companies I know down in London. Um, they do not agree in the slightest about it. Um, but I do feel that they're still going to become stronger from it, um, for whatever reason, because of things like tax breaks or stuff like that. But putting, let's put money. If you put money aside for a second, politically, a games company, for the majority that I know, like um, like us two games down in London, makes the Monument Valley. I can't imagine such a diverse clever group of people will appreciate some form of sort of slight border closing um, in their sort of setup of things. I think the idea of being free and diverse is the reason companies like that exist. And if that impacts that, that'll be a shame, but we'll see. If investing in indie truly is something the industry will double up on, I believe the UK's game industry could come out alright. With an influx of small homegrown development teams and a large umbrella publishers that want to help these companies grow, while uncertain, it'll be interesting to see what happens next. 
about what's been made in the UK, it's all about featuring people, um, artists and developers here. Um, and that didn't used to happen, so I wonder if you know people are looking inward because they realise that we're now going to be potentially on our own. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's not getting, like there might be like bumps along the way, uh, but I don't think that the games industry is going anywhere, I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger. Oh, I can't hear anything though, which is why I'm in here. What the fuck? Okay, well, 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 well. Wow! <laughs> wow! Wow! I can't hear you, it's too loud. Uh, every time the, <laughs> the hook moves, it creates a new audio.